approximately so. And then it's like, it's really so. Um, it, assumptions don't come with little labels on them about whether they're plausible or not. We just make assumptions and see how the theory works. Right? Now, philosophers of science are very good at uncovering assumptions that scientists make. And we find scientists making assumptions like infinities are unappealing. Let's try to avoid them. Right? Let's try to find theories that don't make those assumptions. And that, in fact, is what's driving the search for a thing called string theory. String theory in physics is a, is a theory that's trying to become a theory of what we call quantum gravity. There is this very famous theory in physics called quantum mechanics, another famous theory in physics called the theory of relativity. And we think they're both almost right. But they can't both be right because they're logically inconsistent with each other uh, in many, many ways. One of the ways is quantum mechanics says energy is discrete and relativity says no, it's not. Things like that. Um, but in their areas, they're just fantastic theories. So the hope is that God has built the world, and if I can use this when you're talking, God has built the world such that there is a better theory to be discovered by the physicist, and quantum mechanics and theory of relativity are just approximations to it. And those people who are looking for such a theory think that string theory is the answer. Because what in, we have in string theory is the little particles, like electrons, which are point particles with infinite density in the theory of relativity, are replaced by little loops of string, cosmic string, that are always finite, can never have zero diameter. So by using these as the basic building blocks of the universe, uh, you can get rid of all these infinities that seem to be unesthetic to the physicists. Unappealing. But nobody's got a theory like that that they can test and convince anybody to believe. There are zillions of theories published in the physics journal in quantum gravity in how to unify quantum mechanics and relativity. Einstein spent his whole end of his life trying to come up with a theory like that and gave up. Um, and nobody has really done it since, and it's now 2012. So yes, Scientists hope to find a theory that won't have infinities in it, but they don't have any direct access to God's thoughts here to know that the world was made like that. They're just hoping. But the best game in town is we've got infinities until you can get rid of them, says the other. Now, there are alternative mathematics that people try to come up with for science, in which you don't have this notion of the continuum, of the smooth line between any two points, there's another point all the way down kind of thing. Um, there are finite mathem ma mathematics theories out there. And they are ridiculously hard to use. And if you were forced to use those, you would never be able to really effectively do physical science. So, claim is, don't go there. Now, the mathematician Harvey Friedman, who was my logic teacher when I was in college, um, said the following. For those people who come up with finite mathematics and therefore finite science, it seems like they're committed to the idea that, okay, we've got a rule for given any number, we can generate another number, but that's a finite rule. Okay. But they say things like a number like 10 to the 200, right, couldn't be generated with such a rule because humans just can't do that kind of thing. That's, that's too far beyond. Okay. And Friedman says, okay, then there's got to be some kind of cutoff. There's got to be some kind of cutoff. Yes, you can manipulate numerals, but there has to be a biggest number that you guys have got. Numerals name numbers, right? Okay, so 
Where's the cutoff? What's the biggest number? Okay. And in response to this, this criticism from Friedman, the world's most famous advocate of finite mathematics, this Russian mathematician, um, came back and Harvey Friedman wrote up a couple sentences about his encounter with this guy. And I'm going to end my talk here with this, this little um, quotation from Harvey Friedman. I raised this, just this objection about a cutoff with the extreme ultra-finitist Yesen Volpen during a lecture of his. He asked me to be more specific. I then proceeded to start with, um, oh, I don't need to write this down. You can understand it. Uh, when I say two to the one, right, I'm talking about a superscript on the one. That means two <coughs> times itself one time. And two to the third is two times itself three times, two times, two times, two, and so forth. Okay. All right, so here we go. I'll continue with the quotation. I then proceeded to start with two to the one and ask him whether this is real or something to that effect. He virtually immediately said yes. Then I asked about two to the two, and he again said yes, but with a perceptible delay. Then two to the three, and yes, but with more delay. This continued for a couple more times, till it was obvious how he was handling this objection. Sure, he was prepared to always answer yes, but he was going to take two to the 100 times as long to answer yes to two to the 100 than he would to answering two to the one. There is no way that I could get very far with this. OK, so there we are. How do we do time-wise, by the way? Just tell me how long that uh, lasted. 45 minutes? 45 minutes, yeah. OK, probably about 45 minutes. Uh, I cut out a chunk of, here's what mathematics is, uh, of the infinite, because you told me that yesterday you had talked all about this. What is the infinite stuff? So many thoughts on anything? That was your Professor Harvey? Was oh, Professor Friedman. Harvey Friedman. Harvey Friedman. He, I was just looking him up. Uh, Guinness Book of World Records for teaching at Stanford at 18. Yes, right. I was uh, a lot older than him. This little kid about this Paul comes in, and, <laughs> and I thought, are you old enough to take this class right, on the first day of class? Right? <laughs> and he turned out to be the professor. <laughs> <laughs> He just gotten his PhD from MIT, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, he had been on the side teaching at Harvard, uh, teaching logic. Uh, so Stanford hired him to teach logic and stuff. And eventually, became a very his specialty is rapidly increasing functions, functions that get big really fast. And that's one of the things he likes to deal with. He's he's philosophically inclined. He likes to think about philosophy and math issues as well as do real math. So he's amicable to the idea of infinities. Infinity. Of infinity? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you can't have mathematics without infinity, he thinks. Yeah. He teaches philosophy, or excuse me, he teaches mathematics uh, in Columbus, Ohio, at Ohio State University. Right? Even though he's been all over the place. Um, yeah, so I'm surprised that you ran into this guy. Oh, I've got the great Google. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, you were Googling him while you were talking? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be pop cultural <laughs> What do you think of this argument that uh, of this, uh, do you think that um, there are only finite natural numbers? Or is there an actual infinity of them, a completed infinite set at a time? See, the people who think are finite, finite, or a little bit like Aristotle, who thinks that there are these processes that maybe won't ever end, but at any particular time, they've only been finitely completed. So an analyst can, say, analyze Achilles' run and find at any time a finite number of places he's gone right, without saying he's ever at any time completed an actually infinite number of places, the, the going to of an infinite number of places. How many points do you think there are between your nose and mine? Does it remain to be infinite until we start to give limits or constraints to try to find that distance? Because until then, we're just assuming that it's infinite. Uh, but then whenever we break out the yarn and put them up to each other's noses and we start measuring it with our conventions, you know, the ruler in this case, or a beam of light if we've taken your space and time class, 
um, we can do that. Uh, so, to our conceptual scheme, if I can borrow from Donald Davidson, sorry, naturalists, so I had to deal with that recently. Um, it seems as if we only have the problem of something being finite whenever we're doing a discrete measurement. Otherwise, we could say that, sure, what's the problem with dispensing of our reality as being infinite in that direction? Um, the, the rational numbers, the, uh, the fractions, um, are adequate for every measurement that's ever been made by any instrument. There's no way that you can detect the difference between a rational number and an irrational number. Um, is that okay for your lighting? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so if you were just concerned with measurements and you thought science is the theory of measurement or something like that, then you would never need the mathematical continuum. You'd never need real numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but theory trumps measurement. We need... What's valuable about science is not that it's given us a bushel basket full of measurements, but that it's given us theories that explain the world and are useful for making predictions, for example. One of the most important things about explanations is if we can explain things, then we can make predictions and predictions. 